Greetings, I'm back. I've taken a little break, as many of you know. I'm reporting to you from the winter wonderland of New Hampshire. This is basically my front yard. And uh, after a couple of really bad winters, we've got the real thing happening here. And uh, it's the perfect introduction for the video that I'm gonna bring you today about Aconcagua. And I went there first time in 1993, and I'm gonna show you my film from there called The Power of the Mountain. But I returned there in 2009. And when I returned there, I was filming a documentary for a company that just released all their professional athletes. And as we got there, we had learned of the death of a guide who died literally on the summit of Aconcagua. And I can remember the sensation that it turned my stomach and I literally felt nauseous. I couldn't believe that somebody, anybody would die uh, in such close proximity, but on Aconcagua, which has claimed quite a number of lives, but a guide, no less. So I'm going to do a reaction video of my own documentary that I produced almost exactly 30 years ago from Aconcagua called The Power of the Mountain. I like the copy in it, but some of the music in it is a little sappy, so I'm going to try to remove what I can. And okay, let's bring you The Power of the Mountain. So, Aconcagua, I'm here to do a review today of my own video that I call The Power of the Mountain. It's a video that I filmed and I was an assistant guide on an expedition guiding there. We had six, seven, I believe seven clients there. My job as an assistant guide was to keep an eye on all the other climbers with the head guide that I was working with. But uh, what I really was, was a glorified cook. So you could say I was an assistant guide, but I literally had two Primus stoves going in the vestibule of my tent eight hours a day. That is the absolute truth of it. It took forever to boil water, cook them three meals a day, even in the lunches that we would stop and cook. It was a lot of work. And as you can imagine, the fumes from those stoves poured into the tent and me leaning over them. And little did I know that it started making me sick. And so this climb for me personally of Aconcagua was the hardest climb of my life. I was completely fried. And it wasn't until some years later that I realized that I was probably in a lot of danger. I just didn't know a lot about altitude sickness at the time. And because Aconcagua is essentially really only a seven 1,000 meter peak, I never thought of it as uh, the death zone kind of mountain where people could die. Um, I did return to the mountain in 2009. I went back to help film a documentary for um, a sponsored company with a bunch of world famous mountain climbers. I don't even like mentioning the company's name because I'm just not really a big fan. But I again was reminded how difficult Aconcagua is. It is not anything to be trifled with. And a lot of people say it's just a big pile of rocks. Well, what mountain isn't? But there's glaciers on it and all sorts of intangible dangers. In that year that we went back in 2009, five people, I think it was five, possibly more, People lost their lives that year alone on Aconcagua. And right around the time that we arrived in Mendoza, Argentina, we had learned that a guide friend of some of the people that I was climbing with had lost his life literally on the summit of the mountain. He was guiding a group of Italians and before they had the opportunity to descend, they got stuck in a blizzard or a big snowstorm, lost their way, had to basically camp out for many hours. And in that ensuing time, the guide, Federico Campanini, got altitude sick and the most gut-wrenching experience that you could ever imagine was coming across his remains that had not yet been removed from the mountain at the time that we passed by. And about a year later, I wanted to do a deeper dive into what happened to him because he's such a competent and strong guide. How could somebody, a, a guide, die? 
and it struck me that it was because he had tapped himself out and just like I had done in 1992, granted not of that ability, but I was absolutely spent. And I think if I had had to bivy on or near the summit of Aconcagua for another 24 hours, I probably not, would not have lived. And you're going to see that footage. It's uh, of me. So what I'm trying to say is that a mountain, the mountain that I live right next to here, Mount Washington, is only 6,288 feet high, but every year two people die on it because they are unprepared for the extremes of the mountain environment. In my video, The Power of the Mountain, you will see how dangerous a 7,000 meter peak can be, even one deemed to be so simple and so easy as Aconcagua in Argentina. Let's go with The Power of the Mountain, the spirituality of adventure. And now you'll hear the voice of Mark Chauvin, who was the head guide. Having a hard time holding it steady. Okay, now over to Tom. Where are you, Tom? Oh, I look baked. Look up at me. What do you think of this stuff? Gonna make it? Dear friend, far from being glamorous, the whole business of climbing mountains has a lot less to do with climbing than you might at first think. It isn't about basking in glory on the stormy summit with a brutish wince on your face, although, to be honest, that image is part of what draws me here. Mountaineering is chopping fresh water out of the ice on a brittle morning, priming stubborn cooking stoves, feeding a weary crew in stormy weather and being cold and tired. Mountain climbing is also about confronting fears, battling self-doubt, enduring recurring fantasies of turning back, and it's about patience, perseverance, and willpower. So much for glory, this is the reality of mountaineering. In this game, there are no assurances that you'll make it to the summit, but it's this very uncertainty that brings me here. It's the power of the mountain. This, at least, is my experience. Aconcagua in Argentina is the highest mountain in the western and southern hemispheres. At 22,860 feet, it is a virtual giant. I've come here as a guide with International Mountain Climbing School in North Conway, New Hampshire. If you really get down low, you can put your head on it. <laughs> so what are we cooking tonight? Well, tonight we're going to have rice, thoughtfully prepared by our friend Dan at home. And it's going to be like a little Chinese chicken dinner. We have chunk turkey. Mm. Cans, four of these. I don't know if it's going to be enough, but it should suffice since you've already eaten some. And those were pouring in. Keeping clean, Mark? Head guide, Mark Chauvin, is as experienced as any guide in the world. The six that have paid for the pleasure of our guidance and cooking are truly in good hands. So, this weather, you said that this weather is like typical for camp, trekking camp too? For my luck. How many times have you been here? And how many times has it rained here? <laughs> At least. How am I doing? Can I look in the lens and see if I'm like, catching it all? Looks great. February 1. The Spartan village of Puente del Inca, Argentina is a convenient stopover for people traveling between Santiago, Chile and Mendoza, Argentina. It's as close as we can get to the route up the mountain 
so our expedition begins here. The main attraction is a natural bridge formed by sediment from hot springs. These springs still bubble in deserted bathhouses below. Today we are sorting out over 600 pounds of gear, most of which will be loaded onto mules during our trek to base camp. Down the road sits a peculiar graveyard. It's a must-see for anyone coming to Climac and Cagua. Each person buried here died trying to do just that. Names forgotten in the wind and the weeds. Names of people gobbled up by their passion. Sobering that I noticed the name of a climber from Western Massachusetts. Small world. February 2. Like Indian scouts embarking on our vision quest into manhood, we are alone now with only our fears and the constant drone of the river. To reach base camp, we must trek 40 miles up the Vacas and Relentios valleys over the course of three dusty days. There is no choice, really, but to move forward and let the gentle roar of the river be our mantra, an ohm to calm our irrational thoughts and fears. Good coffee. As a friend of mine said before I left, this is a time to trust the universe, an opportunity to find meaning in our own experiences, good or bad, in ways that parallel my life on a grander scale. Mm. Sage advice. February 3. Pounding feet and growing altitude headaches have been our constant companion. These are early reminders that we are not necessarily limited by the constraints of our physical bodies, but by the strength of our spirit. Nonetheless, we watch with some envy as the muleketeers unload our gear from the quick and powerful mules. It is tempting to dig deep in our pockets to hire the mules out for a ride all the way into base camp, but the trek itself is important for getting into a proper physical state of being. Still have that bag. Wild Things mule bag. The rain gently chimes in with the hush of the stoves, leaving us alone now to thoughts and possibilities. Intermittent light and rain paints pictures upon Aconcagua, as well as upon the blank canvases that we have yet to paint on in the days to come. Tomorrow, however, we step into the picture itself toward this giant that has gathered us here so far from home. Little montage segment here showing the, the long journey into base camp and the camaraderie that we built with the team was really awesome. I actually loved it, but Mark got very, very sick. I don't know what he had. It might have been some flu or something, but he was truly wrecked on this trip. And there was a time where I thought maybe we'd have to cancel the expedition because I was certainly in no place or experience to guide this team alone. Dear friend, the unsung heroes of our three-day trek into the base camp of Aconcagua are the mules and the muleketeers who drive them in. Without them, we'd have to double our loads in weight and make two trips into base camp. That would be nine days of work, enough to waste our strength for when we'd need it high on the mountain. We are more thankful for the mules after considering the power of the Vacas River. There are no bridges along our trail, so we rely on their strength to carry us across. Without the mules, this would surely be the most dangerous aspect of the expedition. With them, however, it's one of the more enjoyable ones. February 5, base camp. The first news we hear upon arriving is that rescuers will be carrying a body down the mountain. The news certainly adds to the subtle emotional flatness of this rather desolate landscape. We're at about 14,000 feet. This is our rest day. 
and this is about as cloudy as it's gotten in the morning, which means nothing. Everybody's feeling good, Mark is getting better, and people are enjoying the plush greenery of our surroundings. Cooking as usual. The mountain, however, reveals beauty beyond words. And despite any hardships we've been experiencing, I'm aware that being here makes being there in the real world that more significant. At 14,000 feet, base camp is our launching pad for moving up the mountain, one small step toward the summit of the largest mountain outside the Himalayas of Asia at 22,860 feet. February 6. Today we moved to Camp 1 at 16,000 feet. Little did I know that this was to be my true fraternal initiation to Club Aconcagua. We left base camp at about 14,000 feet this morning and somehow intuitively I kept postponing it and leaving later than just about everybody. And kind of was burping all day, I couldn't eat any food, couldn't even drink water. And literally about two steps away from having my head be within view of camp one which is about 16,000 feet i absolutely blew chow <laughs> it was like unbelievable foreshadowing <laughs> but as you look out we have some real weather here i feel better by the way i wouldn't be getting up and doing this if I didn't. but that's what it looks like out camp one it's kind of snowing as you can see or can you see i don't know the viewfinder's all fogged up <laughs> <laughs> the viewfinder has never been cleaned before and mark is uh <coughs> holding the group together here a little bit doing his share and then some close the door for Christ's sake. <laughs> and my booty's on with the foul weather in mark and i are delivering the meals to the six others my sickness seems to have gone for now, and my greatest enemy seems to be the lingering fear about what the altitude will do to me at 20,000 feet, 21,000 feet, 22,000 feet. Camp two, only a few hours above us, will bring us into an atmosphere that contains only half the oxygen than at sea level. At 18,000 feet, each step is painful. Our heads are dizzy. Mm -hmm. And most certainly, as we move along at our own pace, there are subtle fears dancing tiny figurines in each of our exhausted brains. Uh. Tiny figurines with the stopping power of a Mack truck. But somehow, we keep moving forward despite all the signs that point down. Each step is a small victory, and our success seems less and less tied to actually reaching the summit. How many fears have we already overcome? How many tiny defeats have we averted because of nothing more than our own spirit and determination? Before Carl Jung died, he explained to someone that his idea of God was basically any event, any person, or anything that shook him up, disturbed him, or tested him to new levels of awareness. With that in mind, this mountain seems a fitting metaphor for life itself, mm. and the difficulties we encounter are a metaphor for God. And now, day. as the winds engulf us high upon this powerful mountain at Camp 2, we are left to consider how important our faith, our spirit, has been in getting us even to this point. So at this juncture, I had been cooking, as I had mentioned earlier, about eight hours a day, two Primus stoves in the vestibule of the tent, and I didn't know it at the time, but that was probably what was making me sick on top of the fact that we were now above 16,000 feet and had a few more days. Mark was feeling better and I kept getting sicker and sicker. And of course, because I'm the assistant guide, I'm not telling anybody about it. While all these clients are well fed and rested and absolutely kicking my ass, it really was humbling to see how strong these guys were. Some of them I still am in touch with today, which is kind of cool. 
But anyway, so onward we went, and I just really wanted it over with. I was not happy at all, and hoping that it wouldn't end in complete failure, or little did I know, my sickness could have ultimately led to my death as well. So let's keep going on with the show for now. Dear friend, life slows to a halt in Camp 2 at 18,000 feet. Tomorrow we will move to Camp 3 at over 20,000 feet, so today we rest, eat, and drink what water we can extract from the frozen puddles nearby while nursing the constant companion of ever higher altitudes, a pounding headache. Rest days are important for making physiological adjustments to a new altitude. However, equally important, rest days help us gain emotional strength for the work that awaits us. Given the choice, most of us opt to wait the day out in the warmth of the tents. Okay, there you can see Camp 2 on the bottom right corner. It's a rest day. It's about noon right now. And you can see how the activity just flourishes around rush hour for lunch. Everybody's in their tents reading, nursing some altitude headaches. Here's a, uh, this is what lunchtime activity is like in, uh, well, what's his tent number three? Bill, reading. There. And yes, there is life in the next sleeping bag over. Hi, Al. Hi, Tom. How you guys feel? I'm feeling better right now. Are you psyched to go to the summit? Oh, definitely. There's Bruce and Dwight. And there's somebody else. There he is. Oh, yeah, my uh, beauty sleep. There's Mark exercising his right to relax on a day off. How you feeling? Pretty good. You can tell it could... Fine art of resting. This is Larry up at Camp 2. Getting us some water out of this plush oasis of fresh water. Most everybody else right now is sitting in the tents nursing an altitude headache. And Larry, like the true Himalayan mountaineer he is, seems to be hanging in there. We are happy that today was nice out, as the weather has taken a turn for the worse. The crew is well fed, and now we await the true test of our abilities. February 12th, high camp, nearly 21,000 feet into the atmosphere. The isolation and piercing images intensify the anticipation of our summit day, which is only hours away. Mark and I, still melting snow at 9 o'clock, have high hopes that our full team of eight will make it to the summit. And as you can see, the weather is nice and calm outside. Oh, let's take a look. Not bad. It's clear like that tomorrow. We'll have a beautiful summer day. And we hope so. Because this is hard work, right, Mark? <laughs> if I could talk, I would. Mark, this ought to be good for a couple cafe con leches down at Puente de Linca, just for the effort. Good night. All right. Bottles. Bottles. Hot bottles yep, for everybody. Yeah, bottle. Hardest day of my life right here, up to this point in time. The power of mountaineering. Where is our success? In mind, spirit, and body, how many times have we conquered a loss of heart, self-doubt?
Our success is pushing through the thousands of steps that seem like they would be our last. Knowing this, the taste of the summit is sweet. Okay, here, here's most of the team that made it to the summit today. One of them got chilly, so he went down. But this is the summit of Aconcagua, the highest point in the Americas, actually. And so what we're gonna do in a few minutes is we're gonna sign our names onto this book and forever be ingrained uh, in the history together. All right. And so this is the team. I, I'm pretty proud to say that I'm with them because I was the last one up here. But uh, thanks a lot. Hey! Hey, all right! I am not here for the summit, but for the struggle. The essence of my experience, of my existence, is that on this mountain I have learned more in one day of struggle than I could in 100 sunny days on its summit. came home from that trip, I was emaciated and didn't realize that I hadn't eaten much and that I was very, very sick during the expedition. And um, I couldn't stop eating for literally several weeks. I probably ate 200 Snickers bars when I got home and that's literally just about all I ate on the trip and including ramen noodles that's where i learned that ramen noodles are a lifesaver but uh i think if that trip were even a few days longer it would have turned out differently I, i'm not saying i would have died i mean i could have and you know and that in the year that i returned in 2009 i uh five people were died on on that year and so there's nothing to trifle with a mountain like that so there you have my retro video from 1992, Aconcagua. It just goes to show you that just because somebody is called a guide, it doesn't necessarily mean they know what they're doing. And I certainly had a lot to learn back in 1992. I'm really thankful to have come out of there with my life, or at least not with some significant health problems. Um, Aconcagua is a dangerous mountain, as are some of the smaller mountains in the world too. 10, 12 miles away as the crow flies is Mount Washington, New Hampshire from where I live and people die there every year. And my next video is gonna talk just about that and how being unprepared is way more of a burden than your desire and your ambition to get to the top of a mountain. So if you are so inclined to subscribe, please do. If not, no worries. I thank you for being here and wish you all well and safety wherever you may be. Peace out, my friends. Thank you.